Hello, I'm Kirsten Aiken. 20 years ago, the little-known Queensland town of Childers became the setting for one of Australia's worst mass killings. 15 backpackers died and more than 70 others had their lives changed forever when Robert Paul Long torched the Palace Backpackers Hostel. I covered the aftermath of the horrific crime. He was captured and charged with just two counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Now as the victim's loved ones, survivors and first responders prepare to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the blaze, the Childers killer could walk free. Childers, a small historic township sitting proudly above rolling hills of rich red soil in Queensland's Wide Bay Burnett. It's a pretty road stop on the Bruce Highway and a popular one for backpackers who come cropping time, work in the fields by day and share their dreams of further travel over a drink at night. Its charms weren't widely known in Australia or overseas until a terrible event in the early hours of the 23rd of June 2000. There's flames leaping all over the place. Nobody knew where anybody was. You couldn't see a thing inside either. No, the smoke, smoke everywhere. was really heavy. Rescue workers had started the gruelling task of removing the bodies from the Palace Backpackers Hostel. Absolute desolation is to be seen inside those four walls. Survivors came to lay flowers at the scene where 15 of their friends had died. Many were only just coming to terms with the tragedy. Someone started yelling at me to get up. There was a fire. I actually woke up the other three um, remaining people and me. So one was above me, two was on the opposite bunk. Um, Peter, who was on the opposite bunk, he then uh, went to open the door and obviously realised, you know, probably then uh, the enormity of it because it was just thick black, you know, um, you know, and a horrible smoke. The floor was hot and burning our feet. Lauren had to drag me along the ground to the corridor. We like ran into people. You could hear people like screaming for their life behind doors that were locked. I was about to leave and I looked behind me and there was two Japanese boys still in their bunks. Um, so I reached around, just like punched them in the stomach, told them to get up and um, yeah, just told them to grab my leg, hold on and um, follow me out. Fire spread rapidly throughout the grand old building from where it began on the ground floor. Firefighters arrived on the scene less than eight minutes after receiving the first call for help. I have memories etched on my brain that'll never, never leave, never go away. Uh, I drove into town past the barricades. It was foggy, smoke hanging in the air. And as I drove up to park outside the post office, uh, I could see the flashing lights of the fire trucks and the smoke from the palace. But what's etched in my brain is the survivors sitting on the footpath, many in just their underwear, some with blankets around their shoulders that, that some of the locals had provided, staring up into the palace. And uh, they knew that some of their mates had not survived and it was almost as if they were willing them to join them on the footpath. Daylight revealed the scorched remains of the hostel and dozens of traumatised, mostly young backpackers who were left with what they'd been wearing. It also became clear many didn't make it out of the burning building. When we first came out, we were gasping for air and just in shock and can't believe that we'd, we'd made it out. But I suppose the first thing, you know, when you're, we were teenagers, 
we were sort of crying about, oh my God, we've lost everything that's important to us in the world, it's all burnt. But then not soon after, people were saying, have you seen this person, have you seen that person? And, you know, I just thought maybe they were they were at the back of the building because the fire brigade closed everything off. You couldn't get from the front to the back. So in my head, I'm like, oh, they're just probably out the back or they've gone for a walk. But, you know, soon it became pretty evident that um, a lot of people were missing, yeah. We were trying to get people in groups of 10 to get a bit of a head count together. Um, and we are coming up with all sorts of numbers because people were just running everywhere. And by looking around, we just knew that there wasn't, not everyone was there and there was gonna be some people missing. I remember asking, like, you know, another person that I was working with was like, where's this person and, you know, this person and then, you know, their friends and stuff. Uh, like you know they can't find them either so you know they obviously went to bed with them they were just in the same room and stuff and they didn't you know so they kind of know that they didn't get out as we got outside and, and, and congregated uh, it became clear there was one person in my room um malay that didn't that didn't make it out he was on the opposite bunk um to me um, and to be honest, that that's, has stayed and probably will always stay with me for a long time. Knowing that four people in a room, you know, and only three get out, you know, why him? Um, you sort of question it and, you know, you sort of continue to wonder. As the hostel's backpackers tried to comprehend the devastation, the town locals rallied to help. Soon the glare of the world's media turned to Childers. Good evening, a fire that swept through a youth hostel in Queensland, Australia is now thought to have killed 10 young British backpackers. It happened in the small town of Childers, Australia. Journalists arrived from around the world. I was among them and reported that afternoon to the ABC's Mark Colvin. Our reporter Kirsten Aiken joins me now from Childers. Kirsten, describe the scene there for us, please. I'm standing in the main street of Childers, opposite the Palace Backpackers Hostel. It's been reduced to a blackened, empty shell of what once was a, a beautiful historic landmark in Childers. There are chairs strewn over its veranda, its glass windows are broken, and its downstairs is now obscured by large tarpaulins brought in to cover the authorities who are expected to begin retrieving the body sometime tonight. Looking up the main street of Childers is another cordoned off area. That's actually uh, the community centre where the, where the survivors are actually gathering. They've been going there today for counselling, uh, grouping there for support, supporting each other and to keep away from the prying eyes of the community and the large media contingent which has gathered. Fifteen people were dead. They were aged between 19 and 48. Most were in their early 20s. Some were found on their way to blocked exits. Others in the rooms where they slept. As the building smouldered, police turned their attention to investigating whether the inferno was an accident or a crime scene. No sooner than we got down there, one of the female backpackers, I think Lisa Duffy was her name, she, uh, she approached me and um, told me that um, she thought it had been deliberately lit. It didn't take long before police appealed to the public for information on the whereabouts of this man, 37-year-old Robert Paul Long. He was known to police in different states and had attracted their attention in the week leading up to the fire. We would ask him not to approach Long. Uh, he has a, a history um, of violence. We had early on that week, um, we'd been down to the Federal Hotel and, and they'd give us a, what we believe was a suicide note. Through the, the course of the investigation, it became apparent that he had some issues with the, uh, the operators of the um, backpacker building. Robert Long actually worked for my, on my farm uh, prior to the fire. Yeah, he had worked there for a number of weeks before uh, 
We had some complaints made by some other staff about they felt uneasy around him and uh, he was let go. In the weeks leading up to the fire, um, yeah, he just just turned very, very strange. Um, very sinister, very nasty um, towards towards the other backpackers. And there's a lot of like muttering to himself, a lot of talking. Um, his actions towards the other backpackers. You know, there's a lot of aggression. About quarter past four. With Long on the run, rumours swirled as to his whereabouts as dignitaries joined thousands in Childers to mourn. The night of the memorial service, straight after the fire, he was actually out in the crowd outside watching it on the big screen. As we mourn them, we are conscious of so many things, of lives unlived, of hopes unfulfilled, of dreams unrealised, of what might, what should have been. A part of each of us will remain here, just as when we leave, we will forever, forever carry a piece of Childers in our hearts and minds. In the days after the fire, Robert Long became Australia's most wanted man. We have a, a positive sighting, but as I've said all along, this sighting is from one person, uh, and I would hope that, uh, that other people would not just then stop looking. Through the media, his parents begged him to come forward. Robert, your mother and I are ready to listen and talk with you at any time. Please pick up the telephone and call. We need to hear that you are safe and well. Remember, Robert, your mum and I love you. We are ready to help you work through the events of the last week. and Let, let us help you, son. The breakthrough came five days after the fire outside a nearby village. This person hide behind this tree. I drove into Howard, contacted the police, grabbed all of the police, and they all followed me back. We were in the process of telling this guy and the detectives got in the car and said, right, we're right behind you, just lead the way. Tracked to a nearby riverbank by a sniffer dog and his handler, Long lashed out with a knife. Another officer shot the fugitive that's when Long, believing himself to be dying, confessed to starting the fire. Police recorded his statement on a $10 note. I'm dying anyway. I started that fire. With Long recovering in hospital, the police commissioner expressed relief he was in custody and that there had been no other serious injuries. The police officer, he's OK. Fine. I think... Uh... His jawbone uh, prevented the knife from uh, moving any further. Quite a dangerous situation, actually. Poor old dog suffered a wound as well. As Robert Paul Long awaited trial in custody, attention turned to why the fire had engulfed the hostel so quickly. Official inquiries revealed the smoke alarm system had been switched off and the illuminated exit signs weren't working. Ten of the 15 victims had been sleeping in room seven. Kate and Lauren switched from that dormitory two days before the fire because they'd had trouble getting a good night's sleep. No one could escape because there was bars on the windows and the doors were screwed shut. The fire was directly outside their door as well. They, can't, they couldn't come past it, they were trapped. 
An investigation by the Fire and Rescue Service found safety had been compromised because of confusion about some aspects of fire safety monitoring and compliance in older buildings. The conclusions led to the introduction of a new fire safety standard for all Queensland budget accommodation. When Robert Long was put on trial in Brisbane, his defence argued that everyone in the Palace Hostel could have escaped if the smoke alarms had been switched on. Ultimately, the jury found him guilty of arson and only two counts of murder. But the trial judge found that while Long deliberately set the fire, the prosecution could not prove that he intended to kill anyone. Long was given a life sentence with a 20-year non-parole period. The Attorney-General unsuccessfully appealed the length of the penalty, describing it as manifestly inadequate. The fact Long wasn't tried and convicted for all 15 deaths continues to anger many of the victims' families and survivors today. And it was a practical decision. To prove murder, you have to prove that someone was killed and you have to identify that person. The two people who were named on the indictment were Kelly and Stacey Slark, who were identical twin sisters, and they were Australians and their parents lived in Western Australia. So it was possible to get their DNA profile by going back to their parents and then working out a DNA profile that would be their child and then confirming that the two bodies were the Slarks. David Meredith says by pursuing two counts of murder instead of all 15, the prosecution could have run the trial again if it had to. While making sure Long was sentenced to the longest non-parole period available under the law at that time. If something had gone wrong and we could still run the trial, then we had other victims and we would have gone to the trouble of them proving their identity. There's probably fear and, and concern in that, specifically the number of people that that perish in the fire. Um, the fact that he was only charged with the, with the murder of the two Western Australian or the Slarkle twins. Where's the justification? Imagine if that was your child. Like, he killed another 13 and attempted to kill, what, well, 69 of us, 69, you know, 84 or something in total. Like, that just makes me so angry and we will do everything that we can to get justification for these families. Also, we have a massive feeling like it's our responsibility to fight to keep him locked up because if he gets out and does it again and we didn't try everything that we could, we would have to live with that. I think there's a, a basic understanding of the reasoning why, but I think they would have liked to have seen further charges laid um, even after the finding guilty of, of the murder of the Slark girls. It's still a raw point right around the world. When sentencing Long, Justice Peter Dutney said survivors and victims' families were unlikely to ever recover from the distress. There have been three of the survivors who have um, suicided and then there were people around this town who also suicided. Um, the, the victims are just, you know, it's like, it's like throwing a rock in a pond and it just, just goes out and out and out and keeps spreading. I, I, I struggled for the first 10 years. Um, the fire happened in June, come November. Um, I had a bit of a breakdown. Um, and then for the next, I know five or six years, November was a time for me where I struggled. At the 10 year anniversary, the memorial service, I was there with my one year old daughter and I was 20 weeks pregnant with my second child. And then Stacey and Kelly's dad come up to me and at that moment I would have done anything to have stopped my life with one of his daughters just to have a first night accommodation in a hostel 
mm. in, a, in a rural town and then you know, somebody attempt to take your life. It's a lifelong trauma, it's not something that you ever, ever get over. Um, we were both diagnosed with PTSD and flashbacks and nightmares and, you know, I can't, whenever I go somewhere I need to know how I can get out of that place. Um, how do you even talk about it? Victims' loved ones, survivors and emergency personnel who were there at the time of the fire have come together over the years to remember that night and to support each other. They were planning to mark the 20th anniversary, but for the coronavirus pandemic. I think it's just as important, not just for us, but for the community, for them to, you know, like, we made such a, as big of an impact on them as they did on us. And, and, you know, like the fellow survivors, we've got this, you know, bond that we'll have forever. And yeah, I think that it's important for them that we come back. Often when a tragedy happens, it's over, it's ended and away it goes. We had those young people that survived the fire stay in our community for quite a period after the fire. We fed them. Uh, we provided for them. Many only had their underwear. I just hope that the families of the, the victims can take some sort of relief that we tried as hard as we could. We did everything within our power as a town and as a community to support the, the families and to support the young people who survived. And I hope that that's some measure of of relief for all of them. But just as they prepared to remember those who were lost and the lives changed by long forever, they're contemplating something they say is unthinkable. Robert Long has applied for parole. He could be free within weeks. Well, I'd like someone to give me a reason why he should get out. You know, like, who can say why he should get out? Like. Everyone knows why he shouldn't get out. He's, you know, he's only got done, apart from only getting done from two people, like two murders. It's, he's not only like, you know, he's affected so many people and the poor families of all those people that have to listen to this right now. Survivors say he should be tried for the murder of the 13 other victims and the attempted murder of everyone else in the hostel that night. The punishment doesn't fit the crime, just plain and simple. How can you do that and get 20 years? He should be um, then you know, charged and, and continue for the rest of his life for the other 13 um, victims. Um, and, and obviously, ultimately, the, the attempted murder for, you know, for 70. Uh, I mean, there was 85 people that was wronged that day and, and families and, and a lot more. Um, so 20 years for, for two, you know, that's, he, he's done that. But start then the next sentence and the next um, phase of his life for the other 83. I'm no lawyer, but our legal system is a joke. Like, like life, how could that be 20 years? You know, like you killed 15, 15 young travellers. He's been, he's been done for two. Um, the two poor girls here in WA, like, if life is 20 years here, shouldn't it be 40 now, like, if it was done for those two? Um, even that's not right. He needs, he needs to be given a life sentence for 15 and the attempted murder of 69. That would be an abusive process. Well, the courts would say it was. That is exactly what the Queensland Office of the Director of Public Prosecution says. The prosecution of Mr Long is at an end. A determination was made at the time which matters would be pursued at trial. That decision has not been revisited. Today, a 30-year mandatory minimum non-parole period would apply to Robert Long's crimes. Survivors from the Childers fire, along with victims' loved ones, have now set their minds to convincing the parole board that Long should stay exactly where he is. 
An online petition has attracted thousands of signatures and the former local mayor and survivor Richard Tempest have hand-delivered dozens of victim impact statements. Richard and I came here this morning uh, to one of those young people that couldn't. We've been assured that victim impact statements are one of the criteria that they will look at. And all we can ask of them is to consider the effect on so many communities across the world. The pain that a number of them have gone through in their life uh, after the fire is when you read when you read it in the letters that they're submitting to the parole board uh, there's a lot of stories to be told out there different people have reacted in different ways it's affected different lives and different families in so many different different ways Burry van der Velden, sister Yoli, was in room seven of the Childers Palace Backpackers Hostel on June 23, 2000. She adored Australia and was just 23 when she died. This is Burry reading aloud his letter to Queensland's parole board. It's outrageous that I have to explain why Robert Long should not be released on parole. Yoli was in the pride of her life, loving her travels through Australia during the past 20 intense years, many people have died from disease caused by grief, among them my own mother. I will fight until I die to make sure this murderer will never walk free. 20 years on, the victims' families, the survivors and first responders fear their long ordeal may never be over. I just don't believe that he should ever be able to walk again free. The damage that he has done to so many lives is palpable and, and it is never going to go away. It's something that you just have to learn to live with and, and it just, just makes me shudder to think that he could get out. Twenty years hasn't changed anything really. The pain is still there. The memories are still there. No one's come back. We've lost more people along the way. So I just don't see why he should be set free. Well, we're still suffering and the poor families are still suffering and they're never going to get over it. So yeah, he just, he can't get out. 